。就很高兴哈，因为从呃前几个礼拜，呃 ，David 就狂写 email， 一直要把呃 Crawler 老师给邀请过来，因为他正好这个礼拜在台创。在一个呃竞赛的评选工作，那我就希望他能够可以的话，提前一天来，来我们叫他走一走啊，走一走，意思就是来给我们给一场演讲这样子，啊、哦，所以还也感谢院长啊、哦，谢谢谢谢谢谢。那呃，我们今天其实有有欢邀请到呃 ，Christopher 呃 ，Christopher Porter 老师过来这边呢，哦，有几个原因啊、哦，第一个是在他是目前在亚洲地区非常非常年轻的一位老师。啊，第二个是他目前所专业的呢，是在呃数位的构筑，还有数位的设计，但是他所着重的是是自然建材，所以你看到他的作品是用很多是用竹构筑在做的。那目前呢，跟我们所上像贝贤老师，还有目前有一些专案做的是用自然建材跟数位科技做结合，其实有非常直接的关系。那第三个呢，是他目前虽然年轻呢，他其实已经在我们亚洲区的电脑辅助设计研讨会。他已经负责是在做关于这个呃研讨会的论文的审核的工作，那所以呢，对于我们所上同学如果有兴趣要投这个呃研讨会的话呢，其实呢也都是在呃他的 control 里面啊。We are talking about that. <笑> OK， 好，那他今天呢会跟我们分享一下他这几年来在呃香港这边所进行的一些专案啊。呃呃，我想今天会是一个非常精彩的一个分享内容，包含了很多很多的细节。我刚看到他的 PowerPoint 有几百好几百页，呃，我不确定今天会讲多少哈，这是非常惊人的一个量。所以呢，我们先一开始是不是先用掌声我们来欢迎呃 Crystal Crawler 教授？ I say something good. I was going to say I trust you. Everything you said was nice and correct. So, um, hi everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm Christoph Krull. It's a real pleasure to finally make it to the school that I've heard so much about. Um, so thank you, uh, Dave, for having me. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and can we kill as much lights as possible? Can we get some more lights out? This one. Even in the back, if you want, this will help. Makes the colors come out a bit better, which is always nice. Okay, yeah. So um, thank you for having me. Today is going to be a very light and fun talk. At least that's what I'm hoping for. But with a very profound topic. Uh, the title is "Bending Rules: Protocols of Error." And I'll be covering work that I've done through my practice. Let's see if this works. Through my practice, which is called LEAD, and through the university where I'm teaching, uh, which is the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, in parallel to this, I'm currently involved in a PhD as well at RMIT. Um, and the talk today is basically bringing all this work together. And I try to make it as light as possible. I'll be talking about washing machines, uh, sailing boats. Chinese goddesses, stormtroopers, bizarre war memorials, Cantonese opera, Greek handsome men, typhoons, Chinese torture devices, and all of that under the title Bending Rules, Protocols of Error. And um, my background is I'm from Belgium originally, but I used to work for quite a while for this uh, feisty lady back in London. And in 2010, I decided to move uh, 9,000 kilometers all the way to Hong Kong and my office is actually right over there, um, which was quite an interesting uh, challenge. You may not notice, but Hong Kong has over 7,500 high-rise buildings and over 150, only 150 single-family freestanding houses. So in terms of context of where you're operating, that's radically different than anything I was used to uh, back in Europe, let alone that I don't speak the language or had a deeper insight in the culture. Um, this is the highest tower in Hong Kong. And this is the highest tower where I'm from, and um, that was the tallest building in Europe for over 400 years. So the whole context in which we're operating is entirely different to me, and the only way I've found to get through it is by either stripping down of my ambition or by adapting to this context. And this talk is about adaptation. Um, this is a project that I was running when I was at Zaha's, and this is in Antwerp. And back then, what you draw, or what you drew, is pretty much what you get. This opened up last year, 
Um, it was a very exciting project to be on. Um, around the same time that this one was being designed and then later on built, this project uh, was designed, it was a bit earlier, in Guangzhou. This is the Guangzhou Opera House. And here what you draw, it was not really what you get. The, the newspaper mentioned within a year of opening that parts were already falling off. And we were all very critical of that and wondering why that is and many theories came about like things in China are always poorly made etc. <laughs> Coming here with a different lens I started to realize that that's not the case that what the reason behind it was probably a lack in authentic dialogue and a lack of proper understanding of how people usually work what is that you're trying to do and how these two worlds can be brought together. Um, this comes with an added challenge that I've faced um, recently in Hong Kong with my office as well. This is the Reba Outline Plan of Work of 2007, which is containing all the steps that you normally have when you're dealing with an architectural project. And you see that it goes all the way from uh, preparation all the way to post-practical completion and occupancy analysis. But the type of design scope that we're given access to usually is only these two concept and design development. And then if you're lucky, they're given the artistic supervision of a local design institute that's trying to make sense of your design project, bring into consideration um, everything they know about local practice. This is a very challenging environment to work with. And one of the main tools that all of us have available to fight this uh, often very difficult battle is that nowadays there is more computational power in your washing machine than people used to put the men on the moon for the first time uh, in 1969. So, and this is a fact, they don't make processors slow enough to just meet the criteria of what you need for a washing machine. This means that currently in your phone you have thousands of times more computational power than they used to put people on the moon. So how are you going to deal with that? And that's a very cheap resource that we all have at our disposal. Um, so my driver was that there must be an opportunity for an innovative type of computational architectural design practice that dis engages with non-digital cultures through strategic dialogue. Um, and for me, the main challenge was what it needs to materialize architecture and what difference does computation and digital technology bring uh, to the equation. So the projects I'll be showing today are all about that. I'll start with some smaller ones and gradually we'll build up um, to the larger ones. The first one is a tiny installation that we did three years ago now in Shanghai for the RIBA in Xinjiangzi, where we were asked to make an art installation for a sushi bar. And we had basically no budget, um, no craft or skill available to work with, uh, but we had the students from Tongji where they had laser cutters. And the whole project was basically made from simple fishing net, these little parts of paper clips and standard acrylic. And this is the video of it. So we built a tube that was just bent, single, ax uh, single curve segments, and underneath that we put two bladders that were hooked up to a timer, and they were made with a manufacturer of bouncy castles. And we just took a standard fishing net that we draped over it and used exactly the same acrylic cut shingle and a very clever connection system using these paper clips to fix all the shells to it so that they wouldn't slide. And every 90 seconds, the installation would take one breath and then it would slowly exhale. And the idea was that people would run around, they would see it, they would be attracted by the color, and just as they're about to leave, they would see that there's something weird happening and that this thing is actually alive or maybe dying. It was for a sushi restaurant, so it was sort of a <laughs> tongue-in-cheek pun that we, maybe we're over-consuming something here. But anyway, it was a very fun installation uh, that we did very quickly. Um, this was two years before that, the Dragon Skin Pavilion, which was the outcome of a uh, design and build workshop that we did in Finland, uh, where we were given a material by uh, a Finnish wood manufacturer, which is uh, plywood with plastic inlays. And you know from your Eames classes probably that if you want to work with plywood, usually you steam bend it, which is very energy consuming. But this material, if you heat it up just a little bit, becomes supple and flexible like leather. So we did a student workshop where we started off by looking 
at what you can do with a material that bends a little bit like leather, so we work with cardboard to arrive at these models. Um, but then we wanted to bring in computation as well. We had a CNC water jet cutter at our disposal, and this is the workflow that we used. All of the panels that you'll see have all exactly the same shape. They're perfectly square. We cut eight shingles out of an eight by four feet sheet, but all the slots that you see here are slightly, slightly different, and they're, of course, controlled by a parametrically driven script. So from these panels, we cut all the slots, we heat it up in a little oven, and on one mold, all exactly the same shape, we manually quickly pressed um, these shells, um, which is what you can see here. Now, that's the little oven, and pay attention to the tolerance and the error that is prone to this construction method. It's very high, um, and that was because we had to find a way to um, form the material in a matter of seconds because this was done in a finished bunker where it was freezing and the material only had a few seconds to set. But so the way this structure stood was by working with an equilibrium surface where all the shells under their pure gravitational load lock into each other. And we made the slots quite wide so that they can actually quite loosely move with one another. But because of the gravity and the overall geometry, the shape found its own stability. Um, and this is us trying to assemble it for the Hong Kong Biennale in 2012. Um, so everything was numbered. The point was that we were going to try to make something that doesn't require plans or sections to build because, frankly, in Hong Kong on construction sites, nobody reads plans or, or, or drawings <laughs> anyway. Anyway. <laughs> But in a matter of hours, after we figured out the system, we managed to create this structure, um, which we then dubbed the Dragon Skin uh, Pavilion because of its obvious um, appearance. But What's important to note is that although this looks like an extremely decorative project, it's very graphic, there is absolutely no fat to the project. It's the most lean design that you can find because there's no waste. Everything does everything. Everything is both structure, boundary, light deflector, texture, um, and it creates this beautiful field of vectors flowing across. You can see how we control with the script that at the top you would have a slightly wider spacing so that light could come in and at the edges we would have everything sealed together um, so here you see how it works at night a beautiful little light sculpture um, we're still waiting for an interior design project where we can apply this as a, 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 a ceiling installation so hopefully that's coming so these two were small scale but they capture the philosophy of uh, materiality materialization as drivers for form as much as design intent. So it's a combination of these three form, formalism, mat matter, materialization as main drivers. Um, this is the Golden Moon project, the third one. It's very timely. It's exactly five years ago. This was an installation that we did for the Mid-Autumn Festival in 2012 in Hong Kong. So you see a formal resemblance a little bit to the Dragon Skin, which was done a year earlier. And the Mid-Autumn Festival is extremely important in Hong Kong, and I assume here as well. It's so important they even put it on their banknotes, and if you can touch Hong Kong's money, then that you really know you're at the core of the culture. Um, but when we started designing this, we started playing around with an idea of a tectonic system where you would just have shells made of sticks with a stretch fabric surface in between it, populated onto these members. And we're tr this is seven days before the competition submission deadline. This is six days. We're trying to see can we do it with the Hong Kong flag. Um, so we had the, the tectonic idea and the materialization strategy in mind. What we were lacking is a shape and a story. Um, so five days before the competition deadline, we were in a bar uh, sketching, and this lady approached us asking what we were doing. She was very drunk um, and kind of flirty. And she told us this story that the legend of the Midoro Festival. And the way she told it was that eons ago, Ho Yi, the Chinese archer, saved the planet from burning when 10 suns were circling the earth, and he shot nine of them, which is why we only have one sun. And to repay him for his great service, the gods gave him the immortality pill. But it wasn't ripe yet, so he was supposed to keep it for one year, and then he could take it and become immortal. So he hid it in his night cabinet, and while his, while his wife, Sermo, or Shanghai, was cleaning the house, she found the pill, and like any good housewife who finds pills, she just took them. And apparently when you take immortality pills that are not ripe, you start to float. So she started to float and the winds 
drifted her away and Hoey tried to catch her and bring her down but he didn't manage and she landed on the moon where she's been waiting ever since for the rabbit to make a proper immortality pill from the herbs that he's growing there. And once a year at the Middle Autumn Festival, Ho Yi can go and visit Sermo. That's how she told it to us. I think it's half accurate, but we thought it was pretty strange, um, a story. And so we thought, well, a young couple that only sees each other once a year, just from sheer friction alone, burning moon. Um, so we decided to make this flaming fireball and link that somehow to the story. One of the real drivers behind our shape was this video that I remember from when I was studying, which is Buckminster Fuller's um, Biosphere in Montreal. This is designed in uh, 70, uh, 69, but burned down in 76 when there was an illegal welding accident um, that took place. And the whole skin burned down. And this image really struck me very hard when I saw it for the first time. So two days before the competition, we decided, let's just go for a burning moon. Uh, we, labeled, we labeled it burning moon, and we thought it would be fun to have a planetoid crashing into Victoria Park. These are the actual competition submission documents. Um, so we wrote a little story about this young couple seeing each other once a year, um, things getting so hot that the moon catches fire. Um, and these were the construction documents that we submitted with the competition panel. So we said, it's straightforward, we built a reflection pool, we put a metal geodesic dome in there using bamboo. We made the double curvature of the sphere. And then with some very simple sticks and hinges and stretch fabric and an LED.